What is going on, everybody? This is your host, Dan Romagno. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of The Past Less Traveled, where we explore some of the most interesting persons, places, and events that you never knew you wanted to learn about. This week, we'll be discussing a moment in time where civilization itself was stopped in its tracks. An event inspired by the fear of eternal damnation, carried out by a region who led the Renaissance in science, art, and writing. This is a story of the destruction of some of the greatest innovative work of the Renaissance and the man who initiated this atrocity. This is the story of the Bonfire of the Vanities. A Bonfire of the Vanities is a burning of objects condemned by authorities as occasions of sin. This phrase most commonly refers to the bonfire on February 7, 1497, when supporters of Dominican friar Savonarola collected and burned thousands of objects, such as cosmetics, art, and books in Florence. Francesco Gucciardini's The History of Florence gives a first-hand account of the bonfire of the vanities that took place in Florence in 1947. Other targets of this purge included books that were deemed to be immoral, such as works by Boccaccio, manuscripts of secular songs, and artworks including paintings and sculptures. Friar Savonarola was a firebrand preacher, the mad monk who briefly turned Florence into a theocracy and church-run police state and initiated the bonfire of the vanities. Friar Savonarola, who lived from 1452 to 1498, was a Dominican friar and religious fundamentalist from Ferrara, who moved his ministry to San Marco in Florence in 1490. He actually had first preached there in the 1480s, but didn't leave much of an impression. Things were different the second time around. He preached a firebrand vision of Christianity, full of the doom and gloom of the last days and admonishments to abide by strict religious rules and eschew all vice and vanity to avoid being on the wrong side of the scales come judgment day. It was an apocalyptic, fundamentalist, moral reductionist, my way or the highway message, bolstered by threats of punishment, both to one's soul in the afterlife, and as his power grew, to one's own body in the here and now, for those that refused to follow his exact teachings. Within four years, Friar Savonarola had a sizable chunk of the city's population under his sway. And when Charles VIII of France ousted the premier Medici family in 1494, Savonarola seized the chance to step in and fill the void of unofficial city leader. Savonarola swiftly created a theocratic republic with himself as its head, and began enforcing his own strict brand of religious purity upon the hapless citizens of Florence. He closed the taverns and outlawed gambling, singing, and dancing. He turned crimes like sodomy, previously merely punishable by a fine, into capital offenses, for which the sentence was death. Public burnings on the Piazza della Signoria became common. Savonarola's reign quickly escalated to near-fascist levels of autocratic rule. The friar-in-chief ignored the Vatican, which was pleading with him to stop giving the church such a bad name, and soon threatened him if he didn't stop and resorted to increasingly violent terrorist tactics to enforce Savonarola's fundamentalist interpretations of Holy Scripture and apply its strict rules to the daily lives of Florentines. By the end, Savonarola was sending shock troops of children, known as the White Shirts, marauding across the city, the gangs forcing their way into people's homes at will and hauling off anything considered unholy or corrupting. Fancy clothes, jewelry, makeup, fine furnishings, and other extravagancies, musical instruments, works of ancient writers and poets, any art that was not of strictly religious nature, and any other display of distinctly unpious ostentation and wealth. In short, vanities. They carted the lot of it to the center of the town, heaped it into a huge pile on Piazza della Signoria, and consigned it all to flames. They called this the Bonfire of the Vanities. Even the great artist Botticelli, who up until then was most famous for his allegorical scenes out of pagan myth, got caught up in the religious fervor and is said to have tossed several of his own paintings into the fire to fuel the flames. 
The artist also abandoned the pagan themes of his youth, which gave us the very famous Birth of Venus and Primavera, now in the Uffizi galleries, and spent the rest of his career churning out vapid Madonna and Child altarpieces and other works on strictly religious themes. One of Botticelli's lesser-known paintings, The Mystical Nativity, has been suggested to be connected with the influence of Friar Savonarola, whose influence appears in a number of late paintings by Botticelli. Though the contents of the image may have been specified by the person commissioning it, the painting uses the medieval convention of showing the Virgin Mary and the infant Jesus both larger than the other figures and their surroundings. This was certainly done deliberately for effect as earlier works by Botticelli use the correct graphical perspective. In the painting, the Virgin Mary is shown kneeling before the Christ child in the center, in the presence of the shepherds and wise men who were visiting him. At the bottom of the work, three angels embrace three men, while seven devils behind them flee to the underworld. Botticelli began painting the mystical nativity just a few days after Savonarola's famous Lenten sermon. Savonarola's message was to repent, distance yourself from demons, and let the angels take you to the Savior. This became the basic theme of the mystical nativity. The inscription at the top of the painting indicates that Botticelli believed himself to be living in the final period before the second coming of Christ. This could be from the enormous upheavals in Europe's religious and political realms, as well as Savonarola's message. The mystical nativity, in a general view, is one of the nativity scenes with Mary, Joseph, baby Jesus, angels, and animals. If you look closely to detail, symbolic and unusual iconography or interpretation of composition images can be made. Each of the symbolic interpretations relate back to the context of Savonarola's sermons. The circle of twelve angels at the top of the painting represent the twelve hours in a day and the twelve months in a year. The angels represent faith, hope, and charity, dressed in the corresponding white, red, and green robes. The angels are pulling people out of a state of religious limbo, saving them from the demons. The words on the angels' ribbons, which cannot be seen except with infrared reflectography, show that the words correspond to the twelve privileges of the Virgin. At the bottom of the painting, seven demons are trying to escape under flagstone, fleeing to the underworld. Some are impaled by their own weapons. These demonic creatures are located at the bottom, where angels are embracing the Gentiles, saving them from their own demons, causing the demons to flee. Another notable innovator living in Florence at the time of Savonarola was Niccolo Machiavelli. Machiavelli was an Italian Renaissance diplomat, philosopher, and writer best known for authoring The Prince, written in 1513. He was often called the father of modern political philosophy and political science. Discussed in Chapter 6 of The Prince, titled, Concerning New Principalities Which Are Acquired by One's Own Arms and Ability, Machiavelli sees Friar Savonarola as an incompetent, ill-prepared, and unarmed prophet, unlike Moses, Cyrus, Theseus, and Romulus. Of Savonarola, Machiavelli wrote, If Moses, Cyrus, Theseus, and Romulus had been unarmed, they could not have enforced their constitutions for long, as happened in our time to Friar Savonarola, who was ruined with his new order of things. Immediately the multitude believed him no longer, and he had no means of keeping steadfast those who believed or of making the unbelievers to believe. By May of 1497, Pope Alexander VI had had enough of the Mad Monk and his increasingly revolutionary preaching, and excommunicated the rogue friar. That, having not quite done the trick, in 1498 the Pope then threatened to excommunicate the entire city of Florence, in mass, for continuing to protect the preacher, and demanded Savonarola's immediate arrest and execution. The ever-pragmatic Florentines finally came to their collective senses. They promptly turned on the friar, stormed San Marco on April 8th, and after a bloody battle, Savonarola surrendered. He was arrested and charged with a laundry list of crimes, including heresy, sedition, and false prophecy. Florentines are also very practical. 
So when they spent a few weeks torturing Savonarola, they were careful not to harm his right arm. That way, he could still sign the confession when they were done. On May 23, 1498, the Florentines decided they'd had enough of the rabid dog monk. With the confession signed, all the legal loose ends were tied up. On May 23, 1498, the Florentines dragged Savonarola to the very same spot on the Piazza della Signoria, where he had put the torch to the city's vanities and sent him to his eternal reward atop a bonfire of their own. The ashes were tossed into the Arno. Florence returned to secular republican rule for a while, until the Medici came back into town in 1513 to take charge once again. Thank you all for tuning in for this week's episode of The Past Less Traveled. I hope you enjoyed it and found it informative and exciting. I would like to remind all of you to please like, follow, and share this podcast. Thanks again for listening. And remember, we are all trapped in history. And history is trapped in all of us. Mm